Good afternoon. My name is Sean Ulmer, Executive Director at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, and I want to thank you for joining me for another in our series of Grant Wood In Focus programs. This is a series of quarterly programs where we dig deeper into some work or uh, career or life uh, uh, aspects of, of Grant Wood. Uh, and today we're going to look at Grant Wood's interest in George Washington and the Revolutionary War. Um, Grant Wood's interest in George Washington and the Revolutionary War is actually part of a much larger interest uh, that, uh, that Grant Wood explores, uh, particularly in the 1930s. Um, in in uh, the 1920s, Grant Wood is painting a great deal in the Impressionistic style. Um, scenes of Iowa, scenes of Europe when he's in Europe, he's going back and forth to Europe. Um, and his style begins to change in the late 1920s, um, due in part to a trip that he makes in 1928 to Germany to oversee the fabrication of the stained glass window um, for the Veterans Memorial Building, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Um, and uh, it's there that he sees Northern Renaissance painting, which is a very different style of painting. It's a much tighter, crisper style of painting than he was doing previously. Um, uh, with his impressionistic style, and it really dovetailed uh, well with a series of portraits that he had been doing at the end of the 20s, uh, which also sort of required a, a tighter style, uh, and, and the work he was actually doing on the stained glass window, where every uh, piece of glass would need to have a firm outline, um, and thus was a very different way of conceiving of, of a work of art than he had been doing with his impressionistic work. So all of these things came together um, in this 1928 trip to Germany. Uh, and, uh, and so his style began to change. It began to be tighter. Um, but with that, and, and something that's not been fully explored uh, and we'll only touch on here today, was a change in subject matter as well. And he was still interested um, in Iowa, of course, uh, throughout his entire career. But uh, this sense of nostalgia of looking back um, uh, really came to prominence. It's not something that you see so much in his impressionistic works, but it is something that you notice in his um, work of the 1930s. I think there are a couple of important reasons for that. Number one was the Great Depression. With the stock market crash of 1929, uh, the United States, in fact, the entire world was thrown into a Great Depression. Um, unemployment was at historic levels. Food insecurity was very, very high. Um, it was not a rosy time. And I think that that encouraged Grant Wood in some ways to be looking back to uh, previous times, to better times, rather than representing the hardships of the 1930s, the hardships uh, that farmers were facing or people in cities were facing, the hardships of the Dust Bowl, uh, the hardships of the Great Depression. He was painting optimistic works, works that looked back to a uh, to a more rosy time in the past, and uh, that we uh, would get to again someday as soon as we weathered the storm of of the Great Depression. Um, and so there is a sense of nostalgia that picks up in the '30s, coincides with this with this new uh, artistic style of his, and I think it is also somewhat reflective of the tumultuous world beyond the Great Depression, um, there was the rise of fascism in Europe. Uh, and, the, and the United States was not immune um, from that. It was quite well aware of what was going on in Europe. Uh, you know, when Grant Wood was in Germany in 1928, Hitler was on the rise uh, and he could see firsthand um, uh, what was going on in Germany. Uh, he, uh, he may not have been able to tell where it was going to eventually go, um, but he certainly was aware of that. And, and fascism was um, uh, creeping into the United States as well. And so um, these nostalgic, wholesome images that Grant Wood was uh, interested in and depicting, I think went uh, hand in glove. Um, with the Great Depression and what was going on in the political realm um, uh, in the world. And so I wanted to start out before we, we jumped into George Washington per se, I wanted to share some of those nostalgic his, uh, history looking works because they provide really good context um, for what we're going to talk about. So um, first, uh, Return from Bohemia, 
Uh, these are not in chronological order, but here I think is a real telling example of Grant Wood, a self-portrait of Grant Wood in front of his easel with all of these figures um, from the past, if you will, um, looking over his shoulder. Uh, he realizes he is part of a lineage, um, that he is the present day uh, uh, member of this lineage of, of Iowans, um, and he, he, that he is very connected um, to the past, to the experiences of his, of his um, uh, forebears. Uh, Victorian survival is another example uh, of kind of looking back here. Uh, this painting based on a family tintype uh, shows uh, a woman with an elongated neck, which is echoed in the elongated neck of, uh, of the telephone next to her, uh, you know, is, is very much looking back to, um, to a previous generation uh, uh, in, in his own family history. Uh, similarly, in a, in a painting like Arbor Day, um, he's looking back to the one-room schoolhouse. Now, he did experience that in his own life, but at this point, of course, he's been living in a city for a very long time. So he's looking back to the time when, uh, when you would take a, a, a horses and wagons to get to the one-room schoolhouse, uh, and, uh, and he's looking back in a somewhat nostalgic way in which many Americans were in the 30s of a better time um, of their youth. Or here, over mantle decoration. Um, this is uh, uh, the painting of a home that exists still today in Cedar Rapids, the Staymates home. Um, but it never existed back in the time when people were on horseback and wearing antebellum, antebellum clothing. And thus, um, uh, he's historicized this. He's put this back into time, if you will, um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, and made it more nostalgic. Um, than it than it was because it really was sort of a uh, a home of his own time, or even something like Young Corn, um, where he's showing people working the land by hand. Uh, certainly, farms in 1930s um, were uh, had machinery, uh, and, but um, but he's showing the this this working family. And this is again the depths of the Depression. Um, this working family, um, what. It, having this beautifully uh, uh, laid out farm, um, everything neatly in rows, everything is order, it's not chaos like the world around them. Um, and, and through hard work, um, they will get through this, they will weather this storm as well, they'll weather the, the Great Depression. So he's looking back to a time really before farm implements and, and you know, um, where just through hard work, um, uh, success was to be had. And similar here in Spring in the Country from 1941, one of the last paintings he completed, um, you see the family working the farm. Um, here, uh, again, although there is modern farm machinery available, Grant Wood is depicting um, the rows um, being tilled um, by, um, by a horse-drawn plow uh, and, and the family working together um, to plant um, those rows. Everything is neat everything is orderly. Um, and again, sort of uh, uh, order over chaos in, in a time that was still um, uh, fairly tumultuous. Well, um, the worst of the depression had passed um, by 1941. We were on the cusp of World War II um, and, and those war, you know, war loomed large um, in, in the uh, consciousness um, of, uh, of Americans. So I'm going to start with the most obvious uh, reference to George Washington, um, and that is Parson Weems's Fable. Um, and from 1939, a wonderful work. Um, you can see not a small work. Um, it, it's nearly 40 by 50 inches. It's a big piece. Um, it was a major undertaking. You, um, this is, of course, in Grant Wood's mature style. Everything that I've shown you so far has really been in his mature style. Uh, a lot of the loose brushwork that one associates with Impressionism um, has now is now completely gone. Uh, but this work it represents um, a kind of a notorious episode um, from uh, Weems's biography of George Washington, which he wrote um, uh, the year that George, uh, after George Washington passed away. Um, so he had this sort of sort of firsthand account of George Washington's life. He talked to a lot of people 
Um, but a lot of the fables around George Washington were embedded in his biography, and they lasted um, uh, uh, throughout the century. This book uh, came out in 1800, uh, and and you know even you know uh, and certainly by by you know, midpoint in the century, maybe even later. Um, uh, everyone knew that some of these were somewhat fantastical stories, including the one of George Washington uh, cutting down the cherry tree um, and then admitting it to his father, which is the scene that we have going on here with the 16, six year old George Washington holding his little hatchet, um, uh, speaking to his father. Parson Weems, um, the figure in the foreground, pulling back the curtain um, with its uh, almost cherry-like uh, fringe um, to reveal the scene to us. It's, it, we are seeing this episode really through Parson Weems's version uh, of, of the account. Uh, and, and there are many different um, details, but again, this is a uh, looking back to George Washington, um, you know, not surprising uh, to be looking at the, one of our founding fathers um, during a, a decade that was, you know, uh, difficult for most Americans. I'm looking back to I cannot tell a lie statement um, and and upholding um, those virtues. Um, it's it's much more uh, of a symbolic than a historical uh, episode from from Washington's life. Um, here a detail of of the primary scene. Um, George Washington, the six-year-old um, with uh, the non-six-year-old head, um, the, the head of a very advanced George Washington, um, speaking to his father, Augustine. Uh, and it's interesting um, to, to, to wonder, I mean, Grant Wood lost his father at the age of 10, um, and George Washington uh, lost his father at the age of 11. Uh, and one wonders, um, uh, although Grant Wood never spoke uh, to it, one wonders if there was some sort of kinships, if, if Grant Wood felt some sort of kinship with George Washington, who also, as a boy, um, lost his father uh, at a young age. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, and so one wonders if that's, is that that's also going on um, in, uh, in the background. As I mentioned, um, uh, this is a, a, a somewhat odd sort of painting in that the young boy, the six-year-old boy, has an advanced man's head. And this obviously is um, the head of George Washington that was made famous by the artist Gilbert Stuart, um, who you see here, whose portrait of Washington is quite famous. He made hundreds of these portraits of Washington. They were quite in demand, um, Gilbert Stuart. And, uh, and, and so they were kind of ubiquitous. Um, and it actually became the basis for the portrait of Washington on the $1 bill. So Grant Wood did not even need to see um, Gilbert Stewart's famous painting, although they were everywhere. Um, he could very well have seen one in the flesh. He could also just look at a $1 bill. Um, here, of course, the head of Washington on the $1 bill is reversed. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, it wasn't always the case. Uh, George Washington on the $1 bill was actually in the same orientation as Gilbert Stewart's painting um, until the 1920s. This is a $1 bill from 1917, um, and it shows, um, uh, Gil uh, shows George Washington in, in the famous Gilbert Stewart um, uh, angle. Uh, and it wasn't until the 1920s. Uh, that the U.S. Uh, $1 bill became smaller um, and the head was reversed uh, on it. It was sort of mirrored, but in reverse. Uh, and so Grant Wood certainly would have seen the $1 bill uh, like this in 1917. Uh, whether he was you know, referencing it um, is hard to say. He certainly uh, is well aware of this particular type of image of George Washington um, from, from Gilbert Stewart's uh, paintings. Uh, here again, sort of a look uh, at the overall scene, and and there's there's more going on here as well. There are other historical elements within um, this this piece, uh, including uh, the building in the background, and and the really the the pose and the, and and the stance of Parson Weems himself. Now, the building in the background actually is an interpretation of this uh, structure. This is the house that Grant Wood moved into in Iowa City in 1935. 
Uh, and uh, when he left Cedar Rapids and moved to Iowa City to teach at the University of Iowa. Uh, and you can see that it's not an exact copy of this building, but strong elements of this building uh, are here. This building, uh, incidentally, was built in 1856. This house was. Grant Wood moved into it in 1935. Uh, you can see it is a brick structure um, and it had these wonderful stars um, uh, on the uh, on the on the bricks. Um, and we do, I'm going to go back one. You do see that here as well uh, against a brick uh, structure. The windows are, are slightly different, but he certainly is uh, referencing it. And if you miss the star, the stars are included throughout uh, along the frame. So the star is very much a part of, of course, stars and, and American history go hand in hand. Uh, but uh, uh, but there he is um, certainly using this new home of his um, as a basis for the structure um, that you know, George Washington as a boy uh, would have grown up in. And then for the overall composition, Grant Wood is quoting this work, Charles Wilson Peel's The Artist in His Museum um, from 1822. Again, kind of looking directly back to uh, an antecedent. Um, uh, and you can see uh, this is the artist, Charles Wilson Peel, holding back the curtain to reveal his museum of curiosities. He had a museum of curiosities. In addition to being a painter, he had a museum of curiosity, and he was the father of quite a dynasty of, uh, of American painters. Uh, and, and so this uh, would have been well known to Grant Wood. It was a famous image. Um, and while it resided um, in Philadelphia, it was engraved, um, and so Grant Wood would have uh, been well aware of it, um, and probably also well aware of the fact that Charles Wilson Peale was a painter, um, and a painter uh, of many things, but in particular, uh, well known as a painter of George Washington. So uh, again, here, sort of by, uh, two, you know, two levels of departure, if you will, um, he gives Parson Weems Charles Wilson Peel's pose and pulls back the curtain, um, and and that would not have been lost on, on people who were aware of art um, that this looked very much like Charles Wilson Peel, and they would have also known that Charles Wilson Peel was a famous painter of George Washington who knew George Washington personally, and George Washington posed for Peel in both of these compositions. So, um, uh, so it, you know, he knew George Washington firsthand. His portraits of Washington are considered to be very authentic, very lifelike. Um, and so uh, uh, it would not have been lost on, on the knowledgeable viewer of, of all of these connections that Grant Wood was making um, in this one painting of, uh, of Parson Weems's fable. Another revolutionary period um, piece that also looks at, a, but looks at a different protagonist, not George Washington, but instead Paul Revere, it's this painting, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. Um, this is also another painting that's based on a literary work. Um, this poem uh, was written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Um, and in, in 1860, it was published in the Atlantic um, in 1861. Uh, and it is about the midnight ride of Paul Revere here again, uh, kind of a, in a kind of fabulistic way, if you will, um, very high vantage point, a very strongly illuminated small town that you see um, Paul Revere riding through, um, you know, really too much too much uh, illumination from a single moon. Um, again, you know, uh, very, very kind of spotlit in a in a sort of dramatic or theatrical way, um, which I think was very much uh, part of the intent uh, of, of the painting. Um, again, capturing this famous moment in American history, this hero of the American Revolution, if you will, or pre-revolution, um, you know, warning uh, this community of uh, of the of the coming of the British. Uh, and and here in in the scene you see um, Paul Revere on horseback. Now, many people will mention um, that uh, there, there are in some sources, and many people mention that that this horse, with galloping as it is, has all four hooves off the ground, and that that's not possible uh, for for horses. There's no point at which 
um, all four hooves uh, leave the ground. But in fact, there is a point in which it happens. It's just not um, in, in a full stride like this. So um, uh, it is um, a number of sources have pointed to the fact um, that this seems to be a bit of an anom anomaly with nature. Um, and that Grant Wood, in all likelihood, used a, a rocking horse or a hobby horse as his um, as his model um, for this particular pose uh, of the horse. Now, he would not necessarily have been uh, uh, aware of of all of the technical uh, aspects of um, uh, of a horse's gallop. Uh, he certainly was aware of horses uh, and had been around them and, and knew them. Um, but uh, it was really um, a Moybridge um, famous um, series of stop action photo photographs of a, of a galloping horse that does prove that there are moments in which a, a horse's hooves, all four hooves, leave the ground. Um, but it's when the forelegs um, and the hind legs um, are, are closest together. Um, so in this uh, example, if see that top strip there. Um, these two, in in particular, these two images in the middle, um, show a moment at which all four hooves are off the ground. But in the scene that Grant Wood is depicting, um, where the horse is sort of at full stride, um, the where the four hooves and the uh, and the hind hooves um, are at farther further ends of, of the horse's body, there is always one hoof that is in uh, contact um, with with the ground. So. Uh, it's just, a, it's sort of really a sidebar that's not really critical to the understanding uh, uh, of the painting, um, but it is something that comes up when people see this uh, painting, uh, uh, and uh, and I thought it would be interesting to just take a moment to say there are moments at which uh, horses' hooves are off the ground, um, just not in the in the moment that Grant Wood um, depicts. Uh, I also wanted to kind of spend a minute, Paul Revere, of course, um, was more than just uh, a Revolutionary War hero. He was actually a silversmith. And, uh, and, and that might have had meaning for Grant Wood uh, on another level, because Grant Wood got his start as a metal worker. Um, he wasn't a painter originally. He actually was someone who, who um, forged uh, metal, who, who worked in, in silver. Um, here uh, uh, on the left is a painting uh, by John Singleton Copley of uh, Paul Revere holding a piece of silver. This, um, you know, uh, dates from from the 18th century. It's in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, and on the right is a creamer um, that Paul Revere created um, in around 1760. Uh, and I think it's interesting to compare that creamer that you now see on the left with a work by Grant Wood um, that he created um, in around 1914, 1915. Um, uh, when he was at the early stages of his career and still working in metal. Uh, not that they are similar, um, but it demonstrates that Grant Wood, of course, would have been well aware of Paul Revere's silver work um, because he himself was in that line of work um, as, a, as a young artist. Uh, and so painting the, uh, the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere might have had extra meaning for Grant Wood um, than, uh, than just depicting uh, this Revolutionary War episode. Uh, turning back to George Washington, um, here the Daughters of the of Revolution um, from 1932, uh, a fair, again, a fairly large work, 20 by 40 inches, uh, show three uh, Daughters of the American Revolution in front of a print of Washington crossing the Delaware. Uh, this is a, a somewhat humorous painting um, a, and Grant Wood uh, was, is uh, poking fun um, at the daughters of the American Revolution. Um, in, as I mentioned earlier, in, in 1928, Grant Wood went to Germany uh, to oversee the fabrication of the stained glass window that was to be installed um, in the Veterans Memorial Building. Uh, and it, at the time was the largest stained glass window in the United States. It was beyond uh, the abilities of, uh, of American producers of stained glass to do a window so large. Um, so um, 
he had sent his, his drawings off to um, the Emil Fry Company in St. Louis. They in turn um, sent them and Grant Wood off to Germany uh, to see the fabrication because um, German craftsmen, uh, European craftsmen in general, but German craftsmen um, were well versed in creating large stained glass windows and um, Grant Wood went over to interpret the colors for them. Um, but uh, so he was over there. Uh, when the window was installed, the Daughters of the American Revolution refused to dedicate it because it had been uh, fabricated in Germany and the United States was still uh, um, at odds, if you will, or still sore uh, at Germany uh, after World War I. Um, even though you know nearly a, a decade had passed at this point, um, uh, so they were not, uh, the window was not dedicated um, uh, and, and remained not dedicated in Grant Wood's lifetime, as a matter of fact, but he was a little cross at the Daughters of American Revolution for, um, for not allowing the window to be dedicated on the basis of the fact that it was made um, in Germany. So he painted this not so flattering image of three daughters uh, of the American Revolution. Um, he could very easily have seen types um, for these women in any number of annual um, pictorial uh, uh, membership books of the DAR. Um, here he's he's depicted them as somewhat uh, tight-lipped, thin-lipped, tight-lipped, um, uh, uh, older women, uh, you know, um, not so pleasant to kind of be around, uh, 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 one would imagine, um, in front of this famous um, painting of George Washington crossing um, the Delaware. Um, and so again, not a flattering picture. It was his way, his artistic way of, of uh, weighing in on their decision not to dedicate his window. Uh, and, and But see, there was, a, there was a joke to it. This print, of Washington crossing the Delaware is based on this painting. This is the Emanuel Leutze, um, Washington crossing the Delaware, dates from 1851. It's a very large painting and I'll show you in, in the next slide how large it is. Um, some 12 by 21 feet. Um, the first version that Leutze created, Leutze was born in Germany, uh, moved to the United States as a, as a young child, was, uh, went back to Germany to study um, in Dusseldorf, um, uh, where, so, where there were so many really good art schools. Um, and, uh, and at that time, many Americans went uh, abroad to study. Uh, if, if they went abroad to study, that's where they went to study. Um, so he's actually in Germany um, when he's painting this large piece. Um, he did a first version in 1849. Um, it was damaged in a studio fire. He restored it. Um, it was acquired by the, the Bremen Kunsthalle um, in Germany, um, but was destroyed um, by Allied bombing in 1942. So that version of Washington crossing the Delaware no longer exists. He did, fortunately for us, create a second version. This one um, from uh, he began this version in 1850. Um, it was completed in 1851, um, and it was put on exhibit um, in New York City in 1851. It was acquired a couple years later um, by uh, a prominent um, a New York collector, changed hands many times um, until it finally uh, was acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 1897. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so uh, it you see here um, that gives you a sense of scale. Uh, it's an enormous work. It was awe-inspiring at the time that it was exhibited in 1851, um, and you know it was uh, became extremely uh, popular. Um, it was engraved many times over. Here you see an engraving. So um, you know Grant Wood no doubt uh, knew the engraving well and included. Uh, a copy of the engraving um, in the painting itself. And uh, Grant Wood's purposeful inclusion of this engraving was sort of to underscore the fact that this image, um, sort of iconic uh, image of an American moment in uh, the American Revolutionary War um, was actually painted by a German in Germany um, the, the water here is not the Delaware, but actually the Rhine River uh, in Germany. Um, and the uh, models 
that Leutze used for um, the figures who are, you know, impossibly too many to be in a boat this size. And of course, you know, one knows better than to stand up um, in, in a rowboat like this, especially when you're trying to push little chunks of ice out of the way. Um, the models were American tourists. So uh, here's a painting by a German born artist um, painted in Germany uh, and has and is now an iconic part of American art, if you will. And it was to underscore the fact that um, uh, that these ladies um, are uh, taking issue with Grant Wood and his stained glass window because it was fabricated in Germany. And yet they stand in front of a print um, of, an, of an image of a composition made by a German artist um, in Germany. Uh, again, uh, an iconic work. Uh, in, in, if you will, uh, of, of American history, um, and that the joke's on them. They don't realize that by standing on principle and not dedicating his stained glass window, um, that they are, are um, um, standing in front of a, of a German piece uh, at the same time, one that they hang on their wall proudly. Uh, and interestingly, just sort of as a little sidebar here, um, I wanted to take a moment because uh, I always found this uh, this this dainty holding of this little teacup, this blue and white, uh, what they call willow wear, um, uh, uh, transfer wear teacup uh, in in the foreground has always intrigued me a little bit. And while that certainly doesn't doesn't pertain to her story of, of Washington, it is another way in which Grant Wood has historicized um, this image because um, it. Uh, was not in his drawing um, for um, this composition. It was not detailed in this way. It was just a plain white cup. cup. And at some point, Grant Wood decided to articulate it and make it um, uh, a blue and white wear, which we've you know, been able to uh, but clearly identify here as, as, as a willow teacup. It's a blue and white wear, um, and it, it you know, re references a um, uh, an Asian um, a story, um, and he's detailed it um, just as it existed. Um, this kind of blue and white transfer wear um, goes back to the 19th century. Um, so it really kind of helps to historicize, um, makes these three women feel older, that they really are products of the 19th century. Their thinking is a product of the 19th century, um, and they're they're held up. You know, they're stuck in that time frame. It really helps to kind of lock them uh, into place. Interestingly, this was still very much a popular pattern, even though it was originated in the 19th century. You'll see these kind of patterns that are Asian influenced. You'll also see on different China. You'll see a courier and Ives um, imagery. Um, and so that's also something that was of, of interest to, to Grant Wood. Um, this particular pattern, though, um, uh, that I've been able to, to identify actually on the bottom is called Wood's Wear. Uh, it is a part of, you know, uh, Willow Wear, it, the bigger umbrella name of Willow Wear. But this was by Wood and Sons in England. And so it was called Wood's Wear. And I just think it's fascinating that this particular pattern was the one that Grant Wood depicted in this painting um, and that the name of the producer, the manufacturer in England, the last name is also Wood. So just probably a, a happy coincidence, uh, but, uh, but, but kind of a fascinating one at the same time. Another uh, composition that focused on uh, the Revolutionary War was this drawing, this large uh, scale drawing of a Revolutionary War soldier that Grant Wood created. Um, this was part of, this was a drawing for um, the stained glass window um, that I referenced earlier that Grant Wood uh, received the commission for uh, in 1927. Um, did drawings, uh, small drawings, and then large two scale drawings. This was a very large um, window, some 24 by 20 feet. Um, this was, as I said, you know, uh, the largest stained glass window uh, um, of its kind in the United States at the time. Um, and that precipitated the trip to Germany for him in the fall of 28 um, to, to kind of oversee uh, the manufacture uh, of the window. 
And in it, you see uh, uh, the central figure um, of that's been sort of identified in, in many different ways um, as, as, as peace um, uh, or, uh, or harmony or victory, all different kinds of ways. And, and along the bottom, um, six soldiers from the six wars that the United States had found itself in um, up to that point in time. So uh, on the far left, you have a revolutionary war soldier and then a soldier from the War of 1812 and so forth until you get to the far, far right where you have a soldier from World War I, um, which is you know at the time that was the last war that the United States um, had been in. Uh, and and part of the and I hear a photograph of of Grant Wood. This is taken from the newspaper. Photograph of Grant Wood and his assistant Arnold Pyle um, uh, overseeing the final um, uh, work uh, when the window was installed um, in the, in the Veterans Memorial Building here um, in Cedar Rapids. And here you see a detail of the of the window um, uh, and of the Revolutionary War soldier. Uh, uh, on the left. And then I, I wanted to include a couple of details of the um, of the drawing itself, which is really magnificent. Um, these are full scale drawings. This is you know, uh, really kind of amazing. Um, but you can see if you look at some of the, the details here, um, um, one of the reasons Grant Wood needed to go to Germany was to help the German craftsmen uh, use the right colors um, in depicting these soldiers, because the Germans would have been very unfamiliar with what a Revolutionary War soldier's outfit looked like. And so you can see in, in writing here, you can see this little word here, which is Holtz, and this little word here, which is Stahl, which is Holtz is wood, and this is steel. Um, so this, they, Grant would describe to them what colors these needed to be um, because they would not have been familiar with the Revolutionary War soldiers' um, uh, outfit. Uh, and so they wrote right on the drawings um, what colors they needed to be as, as guides. Here, another view, you can see here, rot, R-O-T, rot, that's red. This is vice, W-E-I-S-S, -S, that's white. So this would be red and white. Um, as you can see here, again, here's rot, and here's W for vice. Um, here again, the Holtz and Steel, Holtz and Steel. Again, you can see it here. Um, so this was a guide. That was one of the reasons Grant Wood was there, was to articulate for them what these colors needed to be, so that they were using the authentic and 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 true uh, colors of the of of all of the uniforms. Um, and Grant Wood had done his research. He knew what these uniforms colors needed to be. Um, and so that was, again, one of the reasons why he was there. And it was a very, very pivotal trip for Grant Wood because um, that is when he you know, became exposed uh, on a large scale to Northern Renaissance painting and that helped usher uh, a change in his style. And here, another uh, Revolutionary War uh, uh, figure, this is Oliver Wiswell. Uh, Oliver Wiswell um, was a Yale student, but he was a loyalist. He was loyal to Britain, as many Americans were um, at the beginning of the Revolutionary War. And this was a, a, a painting that Grant Wood did um, uh, for a book um, by Kenneth Roberts um, that was uh, kind of a biography, a novel biography on Oliver Wiswell. Um, who, you know, he was a Revolutionary War figure. Um, he uh, ended up being a spy for the commander in chief of the British Army. Um, he became a friend of Benedict Arnold. Um, this is a book that was published in, uh, in 1940 um, to good reviews. And it really sort of looked at uh, an eight year period, basically, in Wiswell's life. Uh, and um, he used his uh, Grant Wood used his uh, assistant and secretary, Park Reinhardt, as the model here. They got a wig, uh, ordered up a wig from uh, Chicago, uh, and the somewhat um, pinched look on, uh, uh, on Wiswell's face, on Reinhardt's face, um, is from both uh, the odor of the 
of the old wig on, on the one hand, but also that that Reinard was unbeknownst to both uh, him and to Grant Wood was um, uh, was not feeling well um, and was in the early stages of appendicitis and, and Grant Wood, uh, the resulting painting Grant Wood thought was perfect. Um, the, therefore, for this, you know, uh, story of, of this uh, loyalist uh, from the Revolutionary War. Um, here you see in the New York Times book review from 1940, um, got a very big write-up there, uh, Robert's book did, and you can see in, in the painting is printed um, in, in full um, in, on the inside opposite the, the, the title page um, in, um, in, the, uh, in the book itself. And here we're going to turn to something that's a little bit more tangential. It, it's more of a hypothetical thing. I think this is over mantle decoration, which I discussed a little bit earlier uh, from 1930. And this is a painting of the Staymates house um, that, you, that I mentioned was historicized. It was placed back into time, it was placed back into the 19th century by the inclusion of a, of a man on horseback greeted by his family wearing sort of antebellum uh, clothing. Now, this house um, did not exist in times when people were uh, were riding on horseback um, through Cedar Rapids, um, and and so he's historicized this and put this back um, in in time. And the overall um, shape of the composition, uh, the placing of this um, this notable local home in this kind of roundel um, it comes right out of. Uh, of old maps, for example. Here, um, Grant Wood's portrait of John B. Turner, pioneer. Um, and you can see that, that Turner is city, sitting in front of a map, actually a, a map that Turner owned. Um, and in the edge of that map, you see these roundels, uh, these, these uh, spaces where notable um, uh, sites have been included. Um, this was fairly typical of, of old maps. In fact, um, this is the map that Mr. Turner owned. Um, it too is in is in the collection of the CRMA. It's the 1869 map of Lynn County, and you can see um, that these these notable locations and sites um, completely surround um, the county uh, map that you see here, uh, and and that is where um, Grant Wood is drawing his. Uh, overall shape um, for over mantle decoration from, and I think I've got a little detail here of the of some of the images that are actually included in the painting uh, of Turner that you see here. But it also made me think of this. We know that Grant Wood was interested in Courier and Ives, um, and and so uh, looking at Courier and Ives prints, uh, I came across this somewhat famous print of Mount Vernon which was the home of George Washington. Um, and I wondered if this was at all at play in Grant Wood's mind. Uh, if so, it would be another connection to, to Washington. But this is an undated hand-colored um, lithograph um, from around uh, 1859 um, of, of Mount Vernon. And I, I thought, you know, for sort of the overall orientation, of the Staymates home. I mean, you could have done this composition in many different ways. You could have done it face on, you could have done it from the other side, um, but he has arranged the Staymates home in much the same manner as Courier and Ives depicted Mount Vernon. Uh, and I wondered, given his, uh, our knowledge that he was aware of and 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 you know, fond of Courier and Ives prints, um, if this was one that he was, that he had knowledge of, or if, um, uh, and if it, if so, did it serve as the basis for over mantle decoration? We have no proof, um, but it is an interesting, I think an interesting comparison. Uh, hand colored uh, uh, lithographs uh, are also something that Grant Wood was to turn to in this same period. Um, you know, he produced a number of lithographs that were then hand colored uh, by his sister and brother-in-law, um, these being four, uh, of them. Uh, and so this whole idea of creating lithographs that would be hand colored, much in the way that Courier and Ives prints were done, um, is it would is an, another interesting uh, connection between Courier and Ives 
and Grant Wood, and potentially Courier and I's depiction of, of Mount Vernon and, and Grant Wood's uh, painting of overmantel decoration. So I'm ending here with a, a, a photograph of, of Grant Wood in his studio um, at Five Turner Alley in front of Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. Uh, you know, interestingly, you know, he's posing in front of the work. Um, really, he's, you know, the work you can see there is framed, um, but it's, uh, he's not, he's not quite done with it. It's not actually the finished work. Um, so it was really sort of interesting that he's got a frame on it, but he's not quite finished with the painting, just that um, that's a, not the point. I just want to kind of end is another sort of example. Uh, all of these examples are really uh, um, examples of how Grant Wood in his mature style in the 1930s um, is looking to this whole series of, of, of nostalgic and historicized images um, that are uh, that speak of a, of a better time, that I think are optimistic, that give hope to uh, people uh, who are enduring the Great Depression, who are uh, seeing what's happening in Europe with great concern, uh, and and he's um, you know uh, creating these works that are, that are not depicting uh, the Great Depression, that are not depicting fascism in Europe, but rather giving people hope that that this too shall pass, that we will weather this um, through through hard work, um, that we that we seek inspiration uh, from our own past. Uh, and and all of these uh, come at the time you know that Grant Wood is changing his style, um, which uh, too might be linked uh, to this sort of change in tenor um, in the world um, in uh, in the 30s. Uh, and uh, uh, and I think it's interesting to take a a, a look, a brief look. Um, and just one aspect of Grant Wood's output in the 30s, that being his interest in uh, and depiction of George Washington and the Revolutionary War um, as sort of a source of inspiration in many cases um, for those difficult times. Um, and while much more work, I think, needs to be done, uh, digging down into, um, uh, into uh, all of what Grant Wood was doing, uh, in particular in the 1930s, um, I think it is it is interesting to take a moment and just uh, see how Washington was significant um, for Wood and and how he saw Washington um, as as a, as an exemplar to help um, uh, Americans weather uh, a particularly difficult time. So I thank you for joining me uh, today. Uh, I hope you uh, join me again um, for our next um, uh, Grant Wood in Focus, which uh, will be in about three months from now. Uh, and the topic there has not yet been determined, uh, but, uh, uh, but I think all of these um, wonderful uh, Grant, Grant Wood in Focus um, uh, programs uh, are, are look at Grant Wood from a different point of view um, and a little bit more in depth than 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 a single sort of overarching presentation, um, and and these can all be found on the Cedar Rapids Museum of Arts YouTube channel um, for you to go back to and visit uh, again and again if you wish um, and see all of these different um, aspects of of Grant Wood's um, life and times. Thank you so much, and I look forward to speaking with you again.